I mean, really, in this country, never has there been so much uncertainty and so much need for wise counsel, nor has a story moved so quickly. In fact, um, two students who knew each other from school bumped into each other in a pub at the weekend, and one asked the other what he was studying, and he said, politics. And the other said, ooh, what period? And he said, 9 a.m. Monday morning to Tuesday lunchtime. <laughs> Well, I think people here can be confident that the, uh, the British civil service is a highly effective public administration, and thank goodness for that, and we should always remember that when we start saying about talking about the pressures on them. Yeah. So they're really good, but they're going to be under a lot of pressure because they, their numbers have been reduced, and this is a mammoth task. This is the biggest political, economic, administrative, legislative challenge in my lifetime, uh, I believe. Uh, and so this is a, you know, a very huge set of issues. And one of the things is that no, none of us have really yet, I think, understood the sheer magnitude of the task ahead. So those civil servants are going to be under great pressure, and they're going to have to look for help elsewhere. But they are very high-quality people. This referendum has thrown up two major sources of constitutional confusion, chaos, if you like. One is the conflict between the referendum and Parliament, the yep. Westminster Parliament, and the other is the conflict between the different parts. So it's Scotland, Northern Ireland, and indeed Gibraltar. Yep. These three places who voted, and London. And London. <laughs> yes. But nonetheless, <laughs> London, I think it's still more difficult to imagine. But Scotland and Northern Ireland in their own ways, and Gibraltar and its very specific problems, um, have a real issue. Now, could they block the process? Could they in some way undermine the process of essentially an English national nationalist move to leave the European Union? Interestingly, though, because I don't think, I mean, you say she's canny, and I don't think Nicola Sturgeon would ever do anything that would impact on what the expressed will of the people of England. I mean, she would be very reluctant to do that, mm. I would imagine. Mm. No, so in yeah. principle, that is true. But what is to stop us agreeing, if we want to, that, OK, we would finished the Article 50 negotiation, mm. but we mm. the, formally the UK leaves, but we continue certain aspects, you know, of, of, transitional, our, of, transitional e phase of, relation, of, of our position in the, e, in the WGO, for example. I mean, I don't know, um, but I don't think we should necessarily assume that this is all going to be really neat I think business should do a hell of a lot more than they did during the referendum campaign. There was a very mixed response from business in terms of actually spelling out the consequences of what was going to happen. We're starting to hear it more now. But if business doesn't get out there, for example, take the issue of free movement, mm -hmm. of, of free movement and, and, and migration and EU workers, it is absolutely essential that business makes it more than clear what the disadvantages are going to be of stopping free movement of labour and where the crunch points are going to come, all of that. And also, you know, right across the board, I think that we're only after the referendum result hearing some of the nightmare scenarios. We should have heard this throughout the campaign. Well, well, I think, I mean, I do think it's important that well, business is being invited by the British government um, in different sectors to identify priorities. Uh, as I understand it, and that is happening. And um, certainly, you know, I would enc be encouraging businesses to take a very clear analytical view of their key interests uh, in any negotiation and to make clear that those are registered. Now, there's been not much point until tomorrow in registering them with the politicians because you didn't know who was going to be in office. But you can register them with the regulators, the civil servants who are going to be in the negotiations, the permanent sort of system that's going to be leading that negotiation. And very soon, I think it would be time to engage with the politicians, privately and publicly, individually and collectively through trade associations, to try to help set the agenda. And it's very important to do that and to make clear what the, what the desirable outcomes are.